Hello friends, welcome to Village of Idiots for Christ, we're nuts for Jesus. And just plain nuts, this is Revelation Wednesday, we close out the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 22. But next week or the week after, next week I'm going to be with mom, taking care of her. Pray for my mom, she has a hip, hip replacement, so it's going well. Physical therapy and everything's going well, but still, she's 77, so uh, just be praying for her, for healing. Um... So, but we're going to start, every Wednesday we're going to do Revelation. Well, the Wednesdays I'm doing this, we're going to do Revelation. We're just going to go from cover to cover, from 1 to 22, again and again and again. See if God opens our understanding and gives us more. I know He will. So, in this hour, this book is all important. It's the only book in the Bible. Out of the 66 books in the Bible, it's the only one that promises a blessing to those who hear it or read it. Back when this book was written, nobody had a Bible like we do today. It was all scrolls, so that sometimes it was just oral tradition. You know, reading the scrolls, that's, that was one of the main jobs of the priest at the temple, to read the scrolls for the people so they could hear the Word of God. May, you know, I can't get people to read this Word. That This is a miracle. 2,000 years ago, there wasn't anything like this. 2,000 years ago, it was a scroll in a temple that came out on Saturday, and one portion was read, and that was it. I mean, you can go through this whole thing in a month, or you can go through it in a year, or you can go through it in 10 years. But your access to the Word of God in this hour is incredible. Don't waste the time. Get in the Word of God. This is all important. 2 Thessalonians 2 warns the, de the coming deception for those who refuse to love the truth and so be saved. This is the truth, the written truth. Jesus is the living truth. God speaks the truth. Spit, the, the truth of God's Word is written, living, and spoken. It's triune like the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Get in the Word of God in this hour. You will be deceived. If you do not know what this Word says, you are going to be deceived at the end of time. Because the powerful final deception coming that 2 Thessalonians warns us about is going to be total. And the whole world is going to be captivated by it. That's in part Antichrist and perhaps other things that, that bring Antichrist into the thing. So this book, again, covers Antichrist. So we're going to end with chapter 22 today. Enough of this introduction. Uh, we're going to end with 22. And we're just going to move forward and, uh, and just keep preaching it and putting it out there. So Revelation chapter 22. The conclusion of the matter, the end of the book, this is the river of life. Then the angel showed me the river of life, the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. Remember, the, the, son, the Father and the Son's throne is in the middle of the city, and that, that river of life is going to flow right from their throne. Isn't that a cool thing? So, again, the, read it again. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. It's going to flow right down the middle of the great street. Isn't that amazing? Just what a picture. That golden street with this beautiful, perfectly clear crystal water. That's life itself. All life comes out of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. So it makes sense that that water of life is coming right from their throne. It just totally makes sense. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now, I read this. I read the commentary on what the healing appears to be. And it's not healing like healing. It represents life and vitality. Um, there's not going to be a need for healing. There'll be no sickness in the New Jerusalem, so there will be no need for the healing. But that word is a misnomer. I can take you right down to, let's see, chapter 2 and... Uh, Let's see, uh, let's see, Tree of Life, let's see, chapter 2, oh, uh, verse, uh, chapter t uh, 22, verse 2, why would the nations need to be healed if all evil is gone? John is quoting from Ezekiel forty-seven twelve, where water flowing from the temple produces trees with healing leaves. It is not implying that there will be illness in the new earth. He is emphasizing that the water of life produces health and strength wherever it goes. There you go, that's the commentary, but that's it. I, mean, I pondered this for a long time, why would there be a need for healing? But it isn't healing in the traditional sense. It's the it's just the total vitality. As you drink this water, if there was any lack in you, it wouldn't be there anymore. It would just fill you up and fill you up. We'll probably be addicted to this water. It'd just be amazing. Let's continue on. Um, no longer will there be any curse. The, the one verse right there, number three. No longer will there be any curse, man. 
All curses gone. All darkness gone. All sin gone. Only reason curses came is because of sin, and sin has been obliterated by God. The throne of God out of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Now, that's an important verse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. Who are his servants? All of us. All of us. They will see his face. Moses himself could not see the face of God without dying. All of us, in, in eternity future, in the new heavens and the new earth, will be able to look upon the actual face of God. It says it right there. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. He's going to put his name right across in front of Yahweh. You know, I just a friend of mine just told me this. I don't know how they figured this out, but the name Yahweh is actually written on the genetic code inside your body. Everybody on the human genome, they've discovered Yahweh written on this. It's like God signed his ultimate creation, his children. He signed his name Yahweh. You can look that up on YouTube. I'm not making that up. So God's name is already on us in our DNA. Yahweh is written. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and he's going to put his name on all of our foreheads. Like we belong to him. We're his kids. It'd be like property of property of property of Paul, property of Abba, property of God, property of Yahweh. <laughs> so cool. Oh, yeah, you belong to God. I see it there. <laughs> Pretty cool. Hey, man, his name's gonna be on your forehead. No, no mark of the beast on the right hand or the forehead. No, because the mark of the beast people they don't get the name of God on their forehead. They get the name of the devil on their forehead. Yeah, Lucifer. Yeah, and his name will be on their foreheads. Man, gosh, <laughs> start. Can you med just meditate on his name on your forehead? It's just driving me crazy. It's so good. Um, there will be no more night. No more night. Night's gone forever. Because night represents darkness, and dark rep darkness represents sin. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever. And no more need for the sun, no more need for the moon. Although there's a new heavens and a new earth, the sun and the moon will not light the, 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 the earth around us. It'll throw them... Again, um, God, the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever. Again, uh, let's see. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever. And we're going to reign forever, ever. And God himself is going to give us the light, and the Lamb is the lamp of that light. Gosh, amazing stuff. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angels. To show his servants the thing that must soon take place. So God wanted to emphasize this. These words are trustworthy and true. Man, he just, he's, I mean, he doesn't have to say that, but he's emphasizing. These words, hey, the words that are being spoken in this chapter are trustworthy and true. Uh, the Lord God of the Spirit of the Prophet sent his angel to show his servants the thing that must soon take place. Okay, now, we're just, that's verse 6. Again, remember the, the order of this book. God gave them, but this is, book is written completely uniquely as well. This wasn't written by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wrote every other book in the Bible except this one. At the very beginning of the book, it says that God handed this testimony to Jesus. Jesus handed it to an angel, and the angel was proclaiming all this to John. This, I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure John was the Holy Spirit was helping John receive it all, but but it went through four hands. It went from the hand of God to the hand of Jesus to the hand of an angel to John's hand. Every other book in the Bible is written directly by the Holy Spirit's inspiration to a person's mind. This is completely unique. This book is precious. This book is amazing. People get all caught up in all the pictures. If you're in this enough, you'll get it. It'll just, it just, it just, it'll open itself up to you. But you have to be in it. Yeah, I mean, you should go. I mean, again, chapter a day, something. Get in this book. Let's continue on. Verse seven. Uh, this is words in red. This is Jesus proclaiming, Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is who, he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Words in red. Words of Christ. Jesus said, Look, I'm coming soon. Uh, blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Man, we want to keep these words, man. Keeping these words. This book is all important in this hour. I, John, verse 8, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. He saw this whole thing was just laid out right in front of John. Right in front of him. Uh, and when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. Again, he might have thought it was the angel of the Lord. And you see that in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord. And it's like, you know, it's like God's spirit sent to me in, in the form of an angel. The angel of the Lord is almost mysterious, but people always fall down to worship at the feet of the angel of the Lord. That might, you know, there's, there's, there's controversy. Well, who was it? Who, what is the angel of the Lord? Is it pre-incarnate Jesus? We don't know exactly. 
But he, that's what Paul, I mean, John might have thought, maybe this is the angel of the Lord. Maybe I need to worship. Maybe this guy directly represents God. So I, it wasn't improper for him to fall down. Well, it was. But again, I got his motivation. He thought maybe this was guy was tied directly to God somehow. So it was a worship was appropriate. I get that. Again, Samson's, Samson's parents fell down in front of the angel of the Lord. Gideon fell down before the angel of the Lord. So there's precedent for them falling, for John worshiping here. Um, do not, and then, but but in but in verse nine he, he warns he said let's read verse eight I John the one who saw these things and when he heard and seen them I fell down to worship the feet of the, the, the angel who had been showing them to me here comes verse nine but he said to me do not do it I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and the and the prophets and all who keep the words of this book worship God so the so verse nine the angel was going look I'm not the angel of the Lord dude that's basically what he said I know I know I know you don't mean any harm here. But don't do this. Yeah, I'm a fellow servant with you. I love what he says. He says, I'm a fellow servant with you, with you and your brothers and the prophets. Man, they're cool. They're fellow servants. The angels are fellow servants with us. Man, we're going to serve together. We're going to serve God together perfectly forever. I mean, we're going to judge angels, but it's not going to be us lording over them, something like that. We're going to have just beautiful joy with those guys for eternity, worshiping God together. Just amazing stuff. I'm a fellow servant. I am a servant with you. I'm not over you. I'm with you. Isn't that cool? Amen. Uh, then, he, then he emphasizes, worship God, boy. <laughs> then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy in this book, because the time is near. Let him who does what is wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who is right continue to do right. Let him who is holy continue to be holy. Now, this is confusing, and this this throws people off. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, let's see. But the book is Christian. Oh, here it is. As Christ's return gets closer, there is greater polarization between God's followers and Satan followers. Again, what this means is because it seems it seems counterintuitive what he's saying here. Let him who does what is does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who's vile continue to be vile. Wouldn't you think he want those people to repent? But it's like the lukewarm people back in chapter three or four, where he said, you know, I wish you were either I wish you were either hot or you're cold. You know, I don't want you to be lukewarm. Don't be playing games here. And he said, look, and basically he's saying, look, if you're going to be doing wrong, then do wrong. If you're going to be vile, be vile. You know, it's not my desire for you to be doing wrong or being vile. But don't be, don't be playing some game with me. Like you're pretending to be good, but you're evil. You know, be whoever you are. Again, God always wants everybody to repent. But this also tells you, this, is, this again is the hardening of the heart as well. Because it ta talks about earlier in the book, people refuse to repent and glorify God. Man, as this book takes place, as a tribulation takes place, every day people's hearts will be getting harder and harder and harder where they will not repent. They refuse to repent and glorify him. They refuse to repent of their evil deeds. They refuse to love the truth and so be him. This strong word, refuse, 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 refuse. Man, if you, if, 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 when, this, when, when, this, when this is all coming to pass, the wrong are going to be doing wrong. The vile are going to be vile. They're going to be locked in, man. They're just not going to want to change. And, but, but again, but then it says, here you go. But let whom does right continue to do right. Let him who is holy continue to be holy. And if you're walking with God, keep walking. If you're being holy, if, you, if you're walking in righteousness, keep being holy and walking in righteousness. Don't be on the fence. Don't be on the fence. If you're going to go dark, go dark. If you're going light, go light. Choose a side. You're going to either serve God or serve the devil. Pick one. God has no respect for people who sit on the fence and are kind of just, you know, kind of biding their time. Okay, let's see who's going to win this battle. It's going to be God. It's going to be the devil. I'm going to pick whatever winning side. No, no, no. If you do that, you're going on the losing side, the devil's side. God don't have no respect for someone who sits. Hey, look, you want to be evil? Be evil. It's not a good plan. It's the lake of fire involved in all that. But if you want to do darkness, do darkness. But pick somebody. Have, a, have, respect, have enough respect for God to pick a side. Have enough respect for yourself to pick a side. I hope you pick right. If you listen to this, you probably have already picked the right side. But man, God has no respect for people who just play games with him. No respect. And, and why should he? You know, do, hey, pick a side. That, how hard is it to pick a side? Flip a coin. Do whatever you can do. Pick something. Pick somebody. <laughs> I'm sorry. But so many people don't want to pick. No, I'm just going to see how this thing plays itself out. You harden, Your heart may harden past the point of being able to repent. Don't put salvation off. You're playing a game waiting. You know, you're going to live your life to your 99 before the bus hits you, and you're going to repent at 99. What if you only live to be 70 and you don't repent? 
Don't play games. This is this is your salvation. This is eternal life or eternal damnation, a lake of fire. Don't play. Pick a side. And we pray and hope and intercede with you to pick the right side. It's smoking or not smoking. Choose not smoking. Because it's smoking and not smoking forever. <laughs> Once you're in smoking, the smoking section of eternity, you can't get out of it. So if you want to quit smoking, guess what? You can't. <sighs> <laughs> I, I, I've diatribed enough along on this. Okay, verse 12. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the, and this is Jesus, words in red. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city, outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. Indeed, he is the bright morning star. Let's break this down. This is 12 through 12 through 16. Behold, I am coming soon. He's coming soon. He's been coming soon for 2,000 years. How much soon? I mean, we're 2,000 years sooner now than it was 2,000 years ago. He's coming soon. We don't know when that is exactly, but boy, it looks like he's coming soon. Israel's back in their place. Israel's time to get here, the timepiece of God in this hour. 1948, 1967, exceedingly important years when Israel got their nation and Jerusalem back. So he's coming soon. My reward is with me. I'll give to everyone according to what he has done. Again, again, like I always tell you, I always show this here. And for you podcasters, I'm holding up a cup of water here or a little Aquafina bottle. Remember what Jesus said. I love this. He said, again, listen to what he says. I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Jesus said, even if you give a lousy cup of cold, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He, Jesus said, even if you get a cup of cold water to one of my servants, you'll by no means lose your reward. Think about that. A lousy cup of water, a lousy bottle, 25 cent bottle of Aquafina. I see one of God's servants. Man, I, man, that guy serves God. I love that guy. That guy preached. I saw that guy preach church. Man, dude, you look thirsty. Here's some water for you, dude. And he goes, man, I'm thirsty. Thank you for the water. You're gonna get. You're gonna be rewarded for that that little bottle of water you just gave to a, a dude who serving Christ. And that's just bottles of water. That's just water. Imagine if you're doing all kinds of cool stuff for God, led by His Spirit. Man, nothing is lost. Everything's recorded. Man, just keep serving and giving and being a blessing to anybody you can. Amen. Um. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last the beginning. Jesus is everything. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit are everything. They're the beginning, the end. The Alpha and Omega, the first and last, they are everything. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that may have the white to the tree of life and may go through the gates. What do we wash our robes in? The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus washes us white as snow. That's what we wash our robes in. It's only his blood that he shed on the cross that washes us of our sin. And your faith in that and your repentance of your sin, just turn him. I'm a sinner. I need that blood. Cover me with your blood so I'll be washed whiter than snow. Blessed are those who wash your robes and may have the right. If you wash your robes, you have the right to the tree of life. If you wash your robes with the blood of Jesus, you have the right to the tree of life. And you may go through the gates of the city. Man, you want to go into the gates of that city. That city's going to rock. That city, I've sh I showed you the picture last week. 1,400 miles squared, length, width, height. Giant cube city and the new and the new earth and the new heavens. <laughs> it covers more than half the United States. Like I said, get yourself a map of the United States. Draw a 1,400 miles square. Measure it out in the middle of the country. You won't believe how big it is. I, said, I did pictures last week. Picture, picture. It's amazing. Again, outside of the dog. Again. And those that aren't inside are dogs, called dogs. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts. If you're playing games, practicing magic arts, you're in trouble. The sexually immoral, all of this LGBTQ stuff, and I don't condemn those people, but all of this gender reassignment, all of this stuff is all darkness. God took the, I've said it and I'll say it, and I'll say it again. Why do you think God took the rib out of the man? One man took the rib out of the person, the man, took the rib out, formed the man, from the woman out of the rib. So, they, so she came out of he, female came out of male, took a rib, formed the woman from the rib, and then married them together. They, of course, there was just the two of them. Brought them back together so that through the sexual act, they become one. Again, they started out as one being, they became two beings, and they came back together in marriage and become one again. It's a picture of the Trinity, if you really think about it. That is the way of it. 
All of this other stuff is sexual immorality, period. Period. I'm not beating up on any of you guys or practicing something else. But think about the rib. Think about what I'm saying. Why do you think God did it this way? He could have took the woman for more dust. He could have made the woman for completely separate being. But God was trying to show from the very beginning. One into one becomes two, and then two come back together as one. The first covenant in the Bible, marriage. That's the point. That's the point of this. You know, if you've been taken prisoner in your mind, in your heart, in your sexuality, and all of these things, pray. Ask God to set you free. To ask God to, to help you line your sexuality up with the Bible. Man. Man, it's, it's God's way is perfect. And his desire for you is perfect. He wants you to get past all that confusion, all that stuff. He's got, he's got a perfect plan for you. Help him, let him set you free. Bible says Satan has taken people prisoner to do his will. Let God set you free from Satan. Let God set you free from this darkness. And follow the biblical course for sexuality. It's, it's, it's right in the Bible. Uh, the murderers, self-explanatory. You kill people or you hate people. First John says you hate people, you're a murderer. So if you even hate people, you're a murderer. It says no murderer has eternal life. The idolaters, you worship anything other than God, including yourself. <laughs> There's some people who look in the mirror and love with themselves. I'm just having fun. And everyone who loves and practices falsehood. If you're lying just to be lying, if you're if you're a pathological liar, you just like lying and deceiving people, you're going to a lake of fire. <laughs> and and lie and, and falsehood is pandemic. Talk about a pandemic. Lying is the ultimate pandemic in this hour. Everybody lies to everybody. Uh, that's a generalization. But man, people have a hard time with the truth, man. That Billy Joel song, Honesty. Such a lonely word. Everyone is so untrue. It's the truth. There's so many, there's so many deceitful, deceptive people in the world today. Okay. And loves, I, Jesus, sent my angel to give you the testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. And the bright Mars. So, so all this stuff we just described, all this darkness, those people will, will never get into the city. They will never be a part of the city. They will be shut out of the presence of God for eternity. The spirit and the bride say, come. We're the bride. We're supposed to say, come, Lord, come. And let him who hear us say, come, come, Lord. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. You're going to be able to drink freely from the water of life. The free gift of the water of life. It's a gift because of the blood of Jesus. Because you wash your robes, you have free access to that because you've been washed by the blood of Jesus. I warn everyone, verse 18, we're almost done. 22 minutes in, not bad as much diatribe as I've been doing today. I've been enjoying this. I love this book. I warn everyone, this is the warning. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to them the plagues in this book. Don't be adding anything to this testimony. I mean, why would you? But people do. People do add to this. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him and share in the tree of life and the Holy Spirit which are, just are described in this book. I mean, you don't want to add to this book and you don't want to take away. And one of the way people take away from this book, and I'm not condemning them, and, and, I'm, and I'm not speaking strongly here, but if you think this whole book is metaphorical, if you think this whole book is already come, I don't condemn you. But man, I've been trying to show how this book is real, how this book is actual, how this book has not come to pass already. Much of it has not come. It's not going to come till the end. I think I showed that last week when talking about those, you know, the, the millennial reign of Christ. And there's no reason to believe that's metaphor. But that takes something away from this book. If you think this whole book is metaphor, you're taking something away from it. I don't condemn you. But man, you read this and read this and read this. You'll see this is no metaphor. This is real stuff that's going to happen. And it just makes sense. This book makes so much sense if you believe it's actual. Because if you start believing this stuff's all just metaphorical, then one in the Bible, then isn't Je couldn't Jesus just be a metaphor? I mean, you start dealing with metaphor, you metaphor everything in the Bible, and you spiritualize everything in the Bible, then what's the point? Is Jesus, do we really have to believe in Jesus, or is that just a metaphor too? It's dangerous territory. If, if, it, if it looks like it's literal, it's probably literal. No matter how fantastic the pictures are, it's probably literal in some form or fashion. Um... And it says, God will take away from his share in the tree of life and the Holy Spirit described in this book. He who testifies of these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Words in red. Jesus is coming soon. Again, 2,000 years ago, 1,900 years ago, this was written. So it's 1,900 years sooner now. This was soon back then. It's soon now. Amen. 
He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Whew, man, what a ride this book is. What a privilege to have the God to wrap things up, to show us what he showed us. In this. I mean, God wanted Genesis is the obvious start of, of, of the word of God. And Revelation is the obvious conclusion of the word of God. I mean, from beginning to end, cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. It's a beautiful river. You can, you can flow through the whole thing. It all ties together. 40 plus men, 1,600 years, three continents, three languages, all sewn together by the Holy Spirit. A perfect testimony of the love of God for all of us, demonstrated through the cross of Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, and his soon return to rule and reign over the children of men. You are blessed. Love you, love you. Can't get enough of you. Whether you're watching the video or hearing the podcast, hope you got blessed. Next week and Wednesday, again, I may be at Moms. I don't know if I'll be able to do this next week. I hope so. But next week, starting chapter one again. So if you haven't heard this whole thing, we're going to start in one every Wednesday from now till the Lord returns until they put me in prison or rip my tongue out or, 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 or do whatever they're going to do to me because I love Jesus. I'm going to keep teaching this every Wednesday. I hope everyone, if I miss other books, this is important. I want to get this across week by week. So love you, love you, can't get enough of you. Hope you enjoyed it. Amen. Be blessed. Love you.